Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, welcome to this session on machine learning and gaming for AWS. I'm uh, Pete Chapman, I'm a solutions architect uh, and I specialize in the gaming industry and working with gaming customers uh, and, and their use cases. And uh, I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues who are machine learning specialists. So hey, hi again, uh, my name is Julian and I'm a tech evangelist with AWS uh, focusing on machine learning as well. Hey, I'm uh, Steve Turner. I'm a solution architect at AWS in the UK, and I've got an area of depth that's very much focused in the AI and machine learning space. So today what we're going to cover is uh, we're going to talk about some different use cases in gaming and how you can make use of machine learning um, to, to really improve player experiences and engagement, uh, and also um, how you can build new different experiences as well um, with machine learning. So. Um, one of the first things I think we should start to look at as a topic is how you can improve game operations. Uh, certainly, like, run, like real time, you know, getting data back from your players, uh, understanding how they're engaging with your game, and really sort of improving that experience um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the audience. Um, a lot of the times today, uh, what, what gaming companies are tend, to, tend to be doing is they tend to be um, grabbing data, collecting it, running automated reports and you know, understanding that data. But often they're interpreting that data manually and spending a lot of time doing that. You know, a lot of data analysts looking at the data and then understanding how they're actually going to improve the game experience. So we're going to sort of start to you know, explore a couple of ways that you can um, improve that feedback loop and really speed things up by using machine learning uh, processes and algorithms. So the first area I think we should talk about is um, you know, how, how we might capture game data you know, and get that into a machine learning algorithm to then understand and interpret. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, on online gaming tends to generate uh, a humongous amount of data, right? Some, yeah. of, the, some of the mobile gaming companies like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Supercell, uh, you know, they have tens of millions of uh, tons, online yeah. players. Yeah. So that's got to be a crazy amount of data. So the first step is to capture it. And, uh, you know, I think customers are pretty fond of using Kinesis for that, you know, funnel the data to Kinesis, which is our, our scalable uh, messaging system, and, and then they can, they can actually uh, uh, push that data through uh, maybe S3 or maybe, uh, maybe a Spark cluster, yeah. uh, some kind of place where you know, they can pile it up, start processing it, and then they can go and, and train models. And uh, I guess you know, a service like SageMaker is, uh, is the right way to do it, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. And you know, when you're taking all that data, uh, one of the hardest parts is actually gathering that data and being able to make understanding of that data as well. So using things like EMR to pre-process a lot of that data, being able to gain some insight and put it into the right format to then actually start understanding the kind of common traits of the data, being able to make meaning from it. Often, some of the data you'll get might be, say for example, it might be missing some data, it might be slightly raw, it might yeah, be... Missing some, values. Yeah, or, missing yeah. values. Outliers. Might, could be in the wrong format as oh, well, yeah. so you it might need a real is. number and an integer. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different ways that uh, you need to do that, but once you've got that data in the right format, then you can start looking at something like, say, SageMaker, to actually very quickly process that data and build models from it. Okay, so if we take that and like look at that in a real, real um, gaming use case, for example. So let's say um, we're, we're looking at um, how players are actually playing our game. Let's look at, say, player retention, for example. So maybe what we're doing then is we're collecting our data on how long a player is actually spending in a game session. Right. Um, and then by the sounds of it, what we can do is essentially use things like Kinesis to pull that information and keep in touch with the, maybe the game clients or, sure. or something that's talking to the game clients to, to kind of track that. And then from there, we can store that in, 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 a, in a central location and then process the data. So, I mean, that sounds really good. I mean, I mean other, other use cases around that might be actually um, areas of, of, a, of a map that players might be more drawn to in, in a game. So, you know, if you've maybe got an FPS or something like that, um, and you've got a really big world map that the, the players are playing on, you might find that uh, players that are, you know, based on you know, location data and where they're actually playing most, that actually part of the map is more enticing to players than others and start to see. see yeah, how it it's, um, you know, you, you need to capture, like, like Steve explained, uh, you need to capture the data and you need as much as you can because that's the beauty of machine learning. You never quite know 
what you're going to need in the end. Sure. You never quite know for a given model what's the raw data that will let you build the features that are actually useful in, 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 in solving the problem. Right. So if you want to, you know, if you want to do player retention or you know predict churn, right, uh, for, for for the game, uh, it's probably a, a classification problem. So maybe you will look at, you know, how many times a player has played in the last month, uh, how long has he played, uh, is he actually making progress, or is he blocked. Um, you know, is he interacted with friends on the game? You know, you, you want to look at things that show engagement, and and, and maybe th those kind of features will help you f uh, predict if a player is likely to keep playing or or, or stop. Right, and yeah. SageMaker could pretty easily let you okay. do that. Yeah. So there's a bunch of built-in algorithms, so they can do things like anomaly detection, for example. Yeah. And so if you've got a sudden spike in players, or say you've got um, certain players that are suddenly accumulating points a lot, lot faster than the majority of other players. You could use that to actually flag it up and be able to get a bit more insight into what they're doing, why they might be doing that. Okay. And then start looking at other things as well, like prediction, as uh, Julian was saying. So things like propensity to take a particular action. Do they want to um, get a particular uh, sort of gem, for example? Do they want to take a particular path within the game? Are there things that actually they're a little bit turned off by the game, and maybe the developers could give some more attention to to improve that player experience. Yeah. I, th I think, you know, from my experience talking to gaming customers, that's one of the, the you hit the nail on the head. I think with one of those use cases there is, you know, actually being able to understand and predict what players are likely to do in a given scenario. One of them being things like player drop off. Um, you know, it's quite often that a game could be really popular one day, and then you know, all of a sudden, it's it's, it's less popular. And, yeah. and understanding or even predicting that is something that could be very very valuable to to, to game developers out there. I, I certainly know that. I think that'd be a really good, um, a really good use case for, for using. No, that's learning. right. And there are um, there's customers out there today that use this technology to try and predict things like if a player is starting to lose interest in the game, right. and if they are starting to lose interest, they may do things like provide them with some personalised offers or recommendations. They might get them more into the game again, so they start playing again. Yeah. And, and could you actually extend that then to um, even predict what? offers and personalized offers, you know, how that would have an impact on the on the player base too. So you start to kind of say, well actually, you know, if I offer this many gems or if I, you know, if I offer a discount for this piece of DLC, yeah. you get maybe an idea of what profile of what players might actually adopt that and, and you know go yeah, for it. Yeah, I'm sure you could apply a recommendation as well, right? Yeah. If you have a large enough number of, uh, of players, uh, you could look at uh, the popular items, uh, you know, that uh, people tend to purchase or or, or, or look for in the game, sure. and uh, and maybe that's gonna help you, you know, recommend the set. And if, and if that's a successful way of playing the game, and you know, uh, going uh, uh, going through the different levels, maybe you can actually recommend the same thing to other players who might struggle with the game. It's like, hey, you know, maybe you should be looking for this artifact. Maybe yeah. you should be looking for this. It's like, hey, this seems to be a popular way. To, to progress and be successful with the game. So, you know, recommendation can, I'm sure, also, uh, it can also be applied to gaming. Yeah, and we've got a, a question from the Twitch stream, actually. So, uh, a user, uh, TurFW, they said, um, is this more about machine learning for in-game features? or more about player data for online games. And I think really it's both. Yeah, so yeah. It's, yeah we're uh, going to talk yeah. about yeah, both. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. definitely not a <laughs> yeah. specific uh, sort of use case. It's meant to cover a very wide range of different areas that are trying to predict things like user behavior or improve the general user experience of the game itself. Yeah, and I think there's also two funnels as well. There's the, the element of uh, understanding player data and how they're actually playing and engaging with the game. Um, and also just general information about the player themselves and their demographics and how they might react to certain kind of more business elements of the game, if you will. And so I think there's those two funnels even on the, the kind of how a player is actually going to react to the game itself. But there's definitely a, uh, applications elements to direct gameplay, which we can, we can touch on in yeah. a bit. We have um, another question, which I think is, uh, uh, is really interesting. Uh, are there any big game companies currently actively working with AWS for this, or is it mostly aimed at smaller companies? So, well, we have millions of customers, and it's fair to say we have all sizes and all shapes. Exactly, yeah. And, <laughs> and it, we go from uh, very small studios to uh, you know world leaders like uh, you know Supercell and sure. Rovio yeah. and King and, uh, and 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 others. And I'm sure you can you can mention so, a whole lot. Yeah. So, well, one big game actually that's uh, that's currently <laughs> running on AWS is For Honor, um, which is a Ubisoft game, and uh, 
So that's um, that's definitely uh, the big one we're working with as well. And, and I personally work with uh, many many gaming companies, uh, big and small, um, for, for these kinds of applications. Yeah, exactly. So it's you know using things like uh, the AWS environment. It's designed for scale, so you can have these. Uh, Customers who potentially they start off as small startup companies who then can scale from say tens of players through to millions of players very, very quickly. And that's something where the kind of overall environment really comes into being a pretty key really. Great, yeah, awesome. Okay. So yeah, it's for everyone. That's, that's <laughs> the short yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, awesome, so actually let's, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, how we might impact or, or, or help the uh, developer tailor the game environment a little bit when it comes to capturing that player data and, and how they're engaging with the game. And one thing I'd like to look at is uh, maybe like how we could um, change the leveling or balancing for a game based on the player's actual kind of experience with the game. Yeah. So maybe um, maybe you could use some of these techniques to actually um, you know, see how the player's doing, whether they're struggling, and then start to tune the game difficulty automatically for them based on you know, whether they're doing really well or whether they're struggling. So you know, does that sound like a reasonable, reasonable use case? Yeah, I think again, uh, you know, things like algos, like uh, clustering or anomaly detection that Steve mentioned. Exactly. They, yeah. they would help you figure out that this group of player, all these different groups of player, are making progress, maybe in different ways, because you know, games are really, really uh, fancy now. There's no single way to uh, yeah. to be successful with them. All the strategy games. So these groups are doing fine, and then maybe these other groups are struggling because. Maybe they don't understand the rules. Maybe they they fail to discover this uh, specific item in the game, yeah. and so you could you could look at those groups. And clustering would do that. Anomaly detection would show you either you know people who are too successful yeah. and maybe they're cheating, right? Maybe you could f do fraud detection as well, and, and 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 you could detect outliers that are just not making any progress at all. And maybe maybe they need help, you know, and, or rewards or yeah. anything else. So again, you know, stage makers going to help you with that. Yeah, and you know, if you take something like, um, so engagement with gaming, uh, you get a bunch of different types of users. So you get your hardcore users, but you also get your casual users as well. And like me personally, I love being able to get a gaming session in, but it happens very, very yeah, rarely yeah, because I've got very small children who are very <laughs> demanding. So to the game developers, if they saw my profile, they'd say he only picks up the controller once a week, he's not even worth bothering. But actually, you could, like you say, cluster these different groups of users to give them a better experience. Because I'm personally turned off by online gaming because everyone is so much better than me. But if they were able to pair Same me here. up with other horrendously... We should uh, play together then. Yeah, <laughs> it just needs to practice more. It just needs to practice more. That's it. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. OK, well, I think actually um, the, next, the next thing we should look at as a, as a wider use case is um, like how we could use machine learning to improve um, production pipeline efficiency for game developers. So um, this is an, an area that really has some very, very specific challenges as an industry. The gaming industry um, you know, is, is really growing very, very rapidly, and the technology is growing with it. And as a result, um, games are getting an awful lot larger. Um, they're getting more complex. And, and of course, they're, they're, they're using more and more um, high quality, very, very uh, big assets. Um, you know, 4K gaming is becoming a standard now. It's, you know, the, the industry is going to go there and continue on. Um, and, and as a result of that, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, need to manage and maintain a huge array of assets, potentially from years back. You know, some, some game developers have been building projects for 10, 20 years. And they've got these, long, these, these big libraries of potentially not very well categorized assets, for, for example. So how could we potentially you know, use machine learning to, to help developers automate the process around um, you know, managing assets, things like textures, yeah. um, you know, images uh, with characters, people, all that kind of stuff. And how can we do that with, um, with machine learning to really kind of help shorten these kind of quite manual um, interactions as they are today? Well, there's a bunch of different areas actually you can touch upon there. And it, it doesn't just affect gaming customers, but it affects uh, any type of customer that has a large sort of archive of uh, assets, and that could be things like media customers, it could be TV, film, and so on. And the, the kind of challenge is that archive grows over time to the point where you've got no idea what those files are without manually looking at them. So being able to apply something like image recognition it would be a really great and fast way to do some classification. And you could use AWS recognition for that to do a kind of first pass to classify the images into the type of image they are, maybe what the scene is. And then you could start building some custom classification models sure. as well in SageMaker, which could 
build on top of that learning to make it more applicable. So if you've got a specific game that's got textures for, say, an ice world, say, for a desert world and so on, and you need certain assets or certain characters, you can build a prediction model to actually identify where those assets are, but you could then build on that as well. And you could have another model which produces recommendations. So through the game engine itself, it could provide recommendations in terms of what assets you might want to use to build a particular type of environment. And, and ultimately, generate worlds, yeah, that yeah. could yeah. result in the kind of procedurally generated worlds that you see in some games today. And I think we have another uh, uh, really cool example of using the uh, DML services. Um, when prototyping games, uh, you need to generate uh, dialogue, you know, uh, speech, etc. So, uh, as we all know, most uh, you know larger games today they use professional actors, sometimes you know yeah. really famous ones too. Um, but in the early days of uh, prototyping and, and, and developing the game, of course, you you want to move quicker than that, and you want to iterate quickly. And services like uh, Amazon Polly, for example, that let you generate uh, a speech from text in uh, 25 languages, uh, it is a great way to quickly build uh, your yeah. uh, your voice uh, <laughs> database, right? Yeah, your speech that's right. Database. Yeah. And you know, maybe use Lex as well to to build a chatbot to start building interaction within the game. So. Yeah, I, I lots of very fancy uh, use cases. I think we have a customer reference yeah, for that. Yeah, there's a, there's a customer already out there. Um, so Go Animate use uh, Poly to help build some of the storyboards straight away. And you know, there's other customers as well where they might use it to get their workflow going very quickly so they can see what the game's like. Yeah. And then when it's close to production and they might want some professional voice actors come in, they can just switch it out. And that way they're not waiting on the voice talent to actually advance the game. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, a real time saver. Um, again, sort of from experience with um, you know, game production, uh, doing things like prototyping, uh, speech, dialogue, um, you know, and having that interactivity seem natural whilst you're developing a game is something that's very, very hard to do before. It required an awful lot of investment, and so being able to essentially have this um, tool that will allow you to you know automate the process of um, you know testing out dialogue, whether it works, um, you know, have it you know, seem somewhat natural as well. And then be able to also extend that to use cases where you know maybe you want NPCs in your game that essentially will react um, and understand natural language and be able to at least and then you know move that towards a kind of natural feeling yeah, sure. speech tree and dialogue sure. um, is is really really powerful and it'd be really exciting to see games start to adopt that actually and oh, yeah. I see some of the applications yeah. behind that yeah clever clever bots and clever yeah, enemies yeah. at last that's it, yeah that'd be, that'd be awesome <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah so that's really cool. So absolutely. So um, and one other thing I guess we, we could um, touch on in here is about uh, localization, which is kind of similar in some ways, so certainly in the same sort of area as um, you know, NPC interaction. Once you've got all of that, um, the, those assets in your game, and you've got the, you know, essentially all the speech and text that you want in your game, um, localization is a task that's often needed to, in order to kind of get the game uh, to a global audience. Um, so you know, not, not the whole world is obviously an English speaker, uh, and therefore um, you know, that's a task that needs to be done. Um, it's often done very late in the, the production cycle, and um, it's usually one of the last things to take place. And um, again, it's usually where you've, you know, you've got a group of people and they're experts in kind of you know language translation who will take the effort to go through the whole game and uh, essentially you know, translate into several different languages. Um, and, and that's something that we can we can kind of help with and really improve with um, with some of the services machine learning to kind of automate the, the localization process. Right? Yeah, definitely. We have a service called uh, Amazon Translate uh, that does uh, real-time translation. Uh, from English to six languages, right. and from those six languages back to English, and you have six more languages coming soon, and I guess mm -hmm. even more later on. Sure. So you, you could do, uh, of course you could uh, translate the, the game assets, okay? But uh, you could also use that, it's fast enough uh, to, to translate you know, uh, chats for okay. online games. Wow. Actually, we have a blog post. Uh, That's right. <laughs> we have a blog post uh, that uh, came out a couple of uh, weeks ago on uh, using Amazon Translate to translate uh, Twitch uh, chats. So, so but real, it could, real time? Yeah, oh, in real wow. time. Nice. So uh, this could help, you know, uh, uh, this could help players from all over the world this actually is. interact yeah. uh, and uh, and yell at each other, I suppose, but <laughs> yeah, it would be fun. Nice. Um, <laughs> so you can understand uh, people insulting you in other tongues. Exactly. Well, uh, you know, that's so that's major progress. progress. <laughs> expansion of, you know, so if, if I can learn all of these things in new languages, and that's, uh, 
That's where you want to be, right? There was a demonstration of this very use case at uh, reInvent. So if anyone has access to, say, uh, the YouTube uh, Amazon Web Services videos, you can go on there and you can look up the launch for Amazon Translate. And one of the demos in there is a Twitch live streaming demo where you're making chat into uh, Spanish and English and being able to interact with other, other people yeah. in different parts of the world. Right, cool. Cool. Actually, we, we were joking about kind of like, you know, uh, people kind of shouting at you and things like that, but <laughs> there is actually a serious application here that you could use machine learning for too. And that would be things like profanity filtering sure. uh, and abuse filtering as well. Sure. Understanding the intent behind what things are being said, you know, real time yeah, chats and messages. Detecting nasty messages and, you know, sending warnings to, to those players and, you know, ultimately uh, kicking them out if they, if they don't behave. Yeah, totally. We could build a natural language processing models with this. Uh, yeah. And and, yeah. and and make the you know the the gaming experience you know fun and stimulating and uh, frustrating sometimes that's for it, yeah. older people like us, uh, but still fun, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And you know you could have a kind of self-learning engine as well, so you wouldn't have to just have a set of rules that have every profanity under the sun in it. Yeah, but you sure. could have something where people could flag up inappropriate comments that could then be re added to the training set and build a more sort of intelligent model over time. So that even insults which you might not know were insults actually then get added to it rather than you having to go and look it up on Urban Dictionary or something. That's awesome. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I guess there's one last area to, to briefly touch on. And um, it's actually in direct relation to the question we had earlier as well is how can we directly influence and impact a game um, mechanic using machine learning? And actually, this is the thing I think about when, when I first, as a gamer, you know, imagine AI and machine learning with games, you know, how they impact, can it could impact gameplay. Uh, one picture I always have in my head is where, you know, let's say for example, I'm playing an, uh, an online MMO RPG, and you know, you've got loads of players playing that concurrently, and they're all attacking you know, like a big boss, um, you know, at the end of a particular quest or, or, um, or sort of section of the, of the map. And, um, you know, it, wouldn't it be cool to be able to have that NPC essentially learn attack patterns? So learn how all the different players are actually, you know, strategizing their attack and beating the, the actual you know, the, the boss, and then have machine learning start to try and you know react and, and actually either you know change the way it defends or, or become more aggressive or you know just completely change its strategy. I think that would open up new you know replayability to games um, and also give them an extra sort of added um, element of real life to them. Um, so you know, is, is that something that's sort of a sensible thing and reasonable? Yeah, absolutely. So you could start building a sort of different ways to interact based on the observed player data. And there might be some ones which a developer would never have thought a player might interact with the game that actually becomes quite a common pattern. And so you could build that into a, a self-learning uh, bot, as it were, that could then go and actually deal with that attack pattern yeah. and could take things like, say, the Kinesis uh, analytics to be able to understand the different player movements that lead to that yeah. and then use that to build up a, a model that says, okay, we can deal with those. And there, there's a specific technique uh, uh, in, uh, in um, machine learning called reinforcement learning. Okay. Um, which, you know, you can do supervised learning where you know what the samples are and what the truth is and you're trying to map samples to truth. You have unsupervised learning, like clustering, trying to group things. And then you have reinforcement learning, um, which is basically uh, looking at samples and really learning in real time from those. So you. And that's a more advanced way. I would love to talk to a, a customer already doing this. But the, the boss, at, at the end of level boss, could be actually learning from, from player attacks, right? So the, bot, the boss could decide, okay, you know, maybe there's a, this narrow corridor, and if, if I walk into it, you know, I get blasted all the time. Because those guys are, you know, yeah. they've laid mines, and they're waiting for me at the end, etc. So, you know, maybe I'm going to die 10 times trying to do that. The, bot, the boss is actually going to die 10 times. And then the boss could decide, OK, I'm going to stop yeah. doing this because it's We're silly. I get up. killed. Yeah, the outcome up. is negative every time. Yeah. So I'm going to try and do something else. And uh, you, you see some crazy demos on, 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 on the web of you know, uh, AI uh, playing games automatically, you know, trying to stay to play you know, driving games or et cetera. It's actually reinforcement learning. So failing, 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 and learning how you failed, and then trying something else. And yeah, if you tend to steer right here, yeah, you'll stay on the road, so you're not going to crash. And then, so it's called reinforcement learning. And uh, I could really see this uh, transforming uh, and, uh, the games, right, and making Absolutely. them so much more interesting. I, I think the thing that I 
heard from that was it actually quite mimics the way human beings learn as well. Yeah, exactly. So I think when you look at you know, <laughs> rush, 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 die, yeah. okay, and then ten times later you try something exactly. else. Exactly, experimentation <laughs> and failure, and I think that that's really nice in games because when you see that. Um, as a player, you see a boss doing that, or you kind of get the idea that that's what's happening. Yeah. It feels natural. It feels much more realistic, and I think that's you know potential uh, potential. Yeah, and you know equally, it's going to keep players more engaged. So sure. if, for example, you've got a game that's actually notoriously difficult and no one gets past the first level before throwing it, this could be a way of making it more accessible to people sure. such as uh, useless players like myself as well to actually still get through it. And see we'll have the to play later. I'm sure you're, yeah. I'm sure you're better than that. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Great. I think we're almost out of time. I think right? we are. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was a kind of walkthrough of uh, what you could do in machine learning in, in gaming uh, with AWS. And I think you know we've thrown all these great ideas out there now. Oh, so yeah. I think maybe we should just build a game and just make make use of them all. And yeah, uh, now I want to play. Then we can be yeah. really good at the game. So. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely, I completely. All right. Agree. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thank bye. You. bye.